All right, what's up, everyone? We are back for another episode of the Pair Program. I'm your host Tim Winkler, accompanied by my co-host Mike Gruen. Mike, um, you know, I like to start things with a little question for you. So, in our uh, team uh, meetings every Wednesday, we we toss out like a hot take and uh, kind of like hot take Wednesday. Um, so, I need your thoughts on this one. This one that came up this past week. Carrot cake is disgusting. Where do you stand? Carrot cake is one of my favorite cakes. So. I am pro carrot cake. I'm I'm in the same boat. I mean, but folks like to argue like, oh, well, vegetables and desserts don't belong together. Those but people I think are just wrong and, and close minded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you. I, mean, um, I, I have a strong opinion on carrot cake. <laughs> it seems I asked the, the right person for this. Uh, all right, cool. Well, let's let's give the listeners just a quick heads up on today's episode. Uh, I am excited for this one. We're calling it Crafting Culture. Uh, and in particular, you know, culture in you know startup environments uh, or different environments uh, as companies grow. Uh, and in this discussion, we're going to be hearing from you know two great guests. Uh, both have very diverse career paths and multiple environments stemming from Fortune 500 to Fang, and uh, of course, some early stage and later stage startup experience. So I am confident that they will bring some very insightful perspective to our discussion. So Anusha and Ben, thank you both for spending time with us on the Pair Program. Thanks for having Glad me. Glad to be here. For sure. All right. Now, before we dive in, we do like to kick things off with a fun segment called Pair Me Up. Um, here's where we're going to go around the room and basically shout out a complimentary pairing. And Mike, as you always do, start us off. What do you have for us? Pair, pair me up. Yep. That was late. So, that was late. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, going back to food uh, and weather, I uh, this time of year, uh, late summer, uh, which it is while we're recording late summer and fresh figs. Uh, I have a fig tree. Um, mm -hmm. One of the benefits from working from home is now I occasionally work from outside on my deck and it's kind of nice having a fig tree right there that I can pick fresh figs from. Um, and it is a very late, late August, early September fruit. Um, so there that's, and you can just pick them and eat them. It's nice. Solid. You throw those in like, I don't know, salads or uh, smoothies and like that. No, nope, we just uh nah, we have just go really straight it out. from the tree. Yeah, just go straight from the, the tree to my mouth. Yep. Okay. Um <laughs> look out for wasps, uh, because there's something known as a fig wasp. Uh, I don't know if yeah. you know anything, but basically you're eating fig wasp and fig wasp larva every time. But I've gotten over it. Never heard of a fig wasp. Thank you for educating. Um <laughs> all right, my pairing is going to be Oktoberfest and hangovers. And yeah, again, I know this episode isn't going to be airing for a month from now, but I, I do like to bring my pairings into the current moment. And currently, I am battling a very solid hangover from an Oktoberfest party last night. And it was an awesome, you know, kind of celebration. There was everything from like authentic German bands that had the classic foods like the sauerkraut, schnitzel, uh, and of course, beer. Um, and I don't know. The Germans are very smart about how they get you drunk because they give us these, I'll show it here, these beer steins that um, you, you can't really tell like how much you've drank. Um, so the next thing you know, you've had a few of these steins and everything starts getting a little bit fuzzier. And, and uh, that's, that's my pairing. It's going to keep it uh, real with Oktoberfest and hangovers. So uh, having been to Munich and, and Oktoberfest, I'm sorry, you really haven't experienced Oktoberfest. I've been three or four times. I do not think your pairing is, is correct because you haven't had the proper experience. <laughs> I feel like the, con the Kanye Taylor Swift uh, uh, on, the, on the Oscars. On the stage? Yeah, okay. that's exactly what happened, man. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're right, man. I'm, I'm not going to pretend like this was the authentic real deal. It, I will say it was a pretty advanced. It was at the German Air Force Command uh, here at Dulles Airport. They, they basically vetted out their, their hangar. And, um, you know, brought in, you know, all the things uh, from Germany, but it's put nothing to compare to Munich. And it is on the bucket list, though. I do want to. I do it want feels to get like that. you were drinking Bud Light. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard again. Man, I can't wait to pass it over to Ben for his pairing. Um, all right, let's do it. Let's, Ben, let's uh, get a quick intro from you and tell us uh, your pairing. Uh, so I'm Ben Wilson. I'm CEO of uh, Olea Edge Ed, uh, Networks. Uh, my pairing this morning is uh, the Disney Genie Plus 
and early morning disappointment. Mm. Those are my two parents. Expand on, on uh, what, why. <laughs> I just came back from Disney with my kids and they make you buy this Disney genie thing to get in line. And like, you have to log on at 7 a.m. And you get up early to log on at 7 a.m. And then you try to get into Rise of the Resistance and it's all taken up and you can't even get in. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I paid like 25 bucks per person for this. And it's like, I already bought the ticket to get into the park. I spent another 25 bucks per person to sit in one line for one ride. And I couldn't even do that. It was like total disappointment. Oh, so, Disney, Disney, yeah, Disney needs to uh, chop it up. But the good, here's the good news. When I showed up to go and look at the ride when everyone was going to get on, it was closed. So I, kind of find, I was a little bit vindictive about it because I was like, <laughs> I was kind of happy that it was closed. And I didn't get on. So I feel bad about that. Share the misery. I know. That's right. awesome. <laughs> well, sh- shot in Freud. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, all right, Anusha, how about yourself? Quick uh, intro and your pairing. Sure. Hi. Yeah, I'm Anusha Iyer. I'm the president and CTO of a cybersecurity startup in the D.C. area called Korsha. And uh, my pairing is going to be kind of a contradiction in terms, but it's morning runs and Dunkin' Donuts. So I uh, basically bribe my son to ride with me, to run with me in the mornings if we can pull off a stop at Dunkin' on the way back. So. <laughs> We've Genius. gotten to the point where that's pretty good. I show up pretty dead, and they know exactly what our order is, and we just keep running back. <laughs> that's that's I, I, I got to run with you. That is like awesome. <laughs> I've never heard that. I want to run with you. That's fantastic. <laughs> so my mom uh, went on a run, uh, a while, you know, a while ago, and um, it was like a sponsored thing, and there was a Dunkin' Donuts like at the corner or whatever that was handing out like to all the runners, like here's some donuts yeah. and whatever. And then you turn this corner and it was right before this huge hail. And so there was oh, just God. all of these donuts tossed. On. Like it was like people took a bite, turned the corner like, no, nope, and <laughs> threw the donut. <laughs> it's just a pile of half eaten donuts at the bottom of a hill. That's awesome. I love it. That's a great parenting uh, negotiation <laughs> yeah. hack right there. Yeah, go I for like a run with yeah. me. We'll get you donuts. That's right. And you know what? 17 years old, you can basically pull off anything. So. <laughs> That's true. That's awesome. All right. Well, I, uh, I, I do want to make the most of our time on the, on the topic today. So we'll, we'll jump into the, the heart of the episode. And like I mentioned, we're going to be talking about you know, crafting culture in these different environments. We did strategically choose our guests given their specific experience from you know, different startup stages up to you know, larger companies. So I thought it would uh, be a good starting point, maybe approaching this from the really early kind of pre-seed seed stages and work our way up to, you know, bigger tech bank size. Um, and so Anusha, I'll start with you. You know, you're the CTO, co-founder of Corsha. You know, over the last few years, you've, you've been growing this from seed to series A. Um, can you just kind of walk us through what those cultures feel like for folks who maybe have never experienced working for a startup uh, or company of that size? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you, uh, we kind of have a, a joke right now. We just moved into a new space. And so we, we call it Corsha five, right? And it's been four years and that's kind of how it goes is you start with working out of a Starbucks, canon, you know, the canonical story to out of someone's dining room table to a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And, and it really is important to bring everyone on the team along and excited for that growth and that, that culture as you're growing. Um, and it's a great opportunity to bring folks in at kind of a ground stage where they get to wear a ton of different hats. So you're looking for people early on that get energy out of that, right? That want to do that. They may 70%, 80% of their day be hands on keyboard, but then they get a little bit of excitement from doing other things too. Mm. So what's the size of, of Corsha today from a headcount perspective? I think we are including a couple of um contractors around 20 20 mm-hmm. cool and so you you kind of started um you know cafe coffee shops um did you do any uh co-working spaces or anything like that prior to moving into the, the office space we didn't actually we um were really fortunate to get some some pretty sweet office space that was actually more cost effective than co-working and we ended up hiring a core team of about six of us, include, not including myself and my co-founder. Okay. 
So it made more sense to just kind of get a small office space. Got it. Um, and we'll we'll dissect this a little bit further. Um, I want to quickly pivot over to Ben. Uh, and Ben, you know, you've you've worked most of your career in bigger companies. Uh, most recently, you were with Google for four plus years prior to joining with um, Olay. Uh, and so uh, I believe Olay Series C uh, stage, you know, I, maybe you can give us a little more context in terms of like where you're at headcount wise as well. But I, I'd love to hear, you know, that transition uh, and, and some things that really you know, come to mind or what stood out for you making that transition. Yeah, I mean, uh, so when I left uh, Google, I ended up uh, at Olea. And uh, we were actually working out of uh, a house slash garage. And it was phenomenal. The CEO, Dave Mackey, he phenomenal founder, phenomenal person. And it was like grit. And like when I joined, you know, I kind of knew the financials. And then, you know, you get into a little bit more and all of a sudden you're like, wow, this, this is tight. This is like really like in August, are we going to make payroll? I'm just, I'm just kind of <laughs> curious because I just got to know, right? And you go through these cycles and you work with the people and you try to understand what's the psychology. Now, we ended up getting funded by Insight Partners in September. So it all, it, it was a great story. But you go through these things that like is really hard to understand unless you work for a very, very small company. And there are only certain types of personalities that can go do it. I would say, you know, my, our founder, Dave Mackey, is one of these people. He gritted it for like six and a half, seven years. I was like, that's, like that, that's not me. I couldn't do that. Right. But going from like, hey, I've got product market fit to kind of the next step, that's a space I can do well in. And so being able to understand where the company's at and what needs they have help you understand whether you're going to be able to fit. Like, uh, I should like think like, I'm not sure I could do zero to 20. Like that sounds really hard. I've been in charge of like, 20 to 100. We're at almost 100 people now. And it's like, that's a different type of scale, a different kind of thought. And that's something I can sink my teeth into. And a lot of that has to do with my background on the, in the bigger companies where I was CTO and you know working for the CTO of Google and all that kind of stuff. Those experiences kind of brought me to the place where I could go do it. But I certainly couldn't do 0 to 20. 0 to 20 is a whole different ballgame. Let's break that down a little bit because I think... Um... I think that it's it's one of my favorite uh, sizes to really kind of uh, dissect, and and we work with you know startups that are usually in that seed to A. Um, you know, I, I started my business out of my garage ten years ago, and my first hire is now my business partner and COO. And that that relationship in those very early stages, they they oftentimes equate it to like you're a family, um, yeah. and and often the co-founder relationship is like a marriage. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested, Anisha, on, you know, how did you, you know, navigating those waters with getting those first folks on board, um, the level of trust that needs to be there? And then how do you kind of feel like they're that fit that they're going to adapt into this environment because it's high risk? It's wearing multiple hats, like you mentioned. Uh, you know, what are you doing, you know, as a leader to kind of like, F figure out who's the, gonna who's gonna work here, who's gonna thrive, and then who this isn't really a great fit for. Yeah, it's it's a great point. It really is, um, you know, if not a family, definitely a really tight village, right? Really tight community, um, especially if you have a co-founder. You end up hopefully by a couple of years in finishing each other's sentences, mm -hmm. right? That's what you want. Is you want that alignment. Um, and, and for us, we ended up kind of starting with deep tech that we knew a lot of folks wouldn't necessarily have the background in coming into it. So there was also the, the technical aspect of it, of like coming up to speed with the tech stack and the whole bit. And so it's, you know, it's to, um, like Mike's point, it is definitely grit. You, you have to look for people that are willing to stick it in there regardless of what it's going to take. And there will be ebbs and flows, right? But, you know, I could tell you right now, I remember one of our, our first um, POCs that we were doing. It was with a, a pretty large system integrator and we were working on it for months. And then, of course, the night before we're supposed to deliver right on schedule, we run into a major issue, right? 
Um, and that weekend, you know, we knew that, okay, it's all hands on deck and uh, middle of the summer in DC, we don't have AC in the building. So we relocated everyone to a house, like to my house actually. And it's one of those bonding experiences by the end of the weekend, we got there, but it was after a, a house full of beer bottles and pizzas and you know, the place basically looked like it had gone through a frat party, but, <laughs> you know, so that kind of thing. And and we got there, but it's that bonding that really, those kind of experiences really bond a team, mm. right? Um, and you have to have the mindset to be able to kind of survive those ebbs and flows that a startup type environment just calls for. Um, and I wouldn't even say you know, it's a particular demographic. It's not like it's a particular type of individual. It really is just that that grit and that belief that you're building something bigger together. I think it's also buying into the idea, like those moments, I've gone through plenty of those in my career as well, like being in a small company and doing, you know, those crazy whatever. It's those yeah. experiences that you then draw on in the future, even though at the time it seemed like it, it was like, terrible and whatever there were fires yeah. and it was like chaotic at the same time that's like when you're a larger company a little bit down the road whatever being able to draw the energy from those times and and sort of remember that it's just this kind of weird thing and i think if you're not the type of person who can embrace that type of environment then right it's not going to be a good fit um for sure um yeah so that, that's an important part and, and it's great but it's also just knowing that like there's something there's something more to it than just Mm -hmm. persevering it's not just i need to survive this you know yeah. it's a little more than that it, it is it's almost like you know at the stage of zero to 20 you almost have to be somewhat uncompromising right because mm -hmm. you're building the foundation for a lot of what's going to follow both from a, a product and technology perspective but also a culture perspective and so you have to set what your baselines are really early in and and not compromise on those even when it's you know, those crunch moments and it's potentially easy to do. And those are stories that I'm hearing from our team now is we're bringing in a fresh wave of folks where they're saying, no, well, this is our baseline. We don't we don't do that or we won't compromise on that, regardless of what the situation calls for, because we know we've survived it, survived it before. Mm -hmm. It's a good segue into like. A, so, Ben, you said that you you all went from was it 20 to 80? About 30 to 100. 30 to 100. Um, and so, you know, how do you keep folks engaged? I mean, that's, that's crazy. That's, that's a lot of growth within what, what time span was it? Uh, nine months. Wow. So how do you keep those folks kind of engaged? Well, one, one, how do you even hire like that? That's insane. We'd love to hear, see your roadmap on, on, you know, what firms you use for that. That is uh, truly impressive. I, I want to know, like, how do you keep folks engaged at that rapid pace? Without feeling like, you know, they're just I don't know, one more number added to the bunch, uh, but like almost, you know, each hire, you know, you're a special addition here. And uh, what, what is it that you all do that's that's special that that carves that out for folks? You know, I mean, I think it's it, when you have to think about, it, right, you got to break it down into a team and you got to tell the team it's special. Because every team is special. It's like, you know, you think about it, like the engineers are always like, it, well, if it wasn't for me, there wouldn't be any product and there wouldn't be any any need to do anything. It's like, well, yeah, but like. If there aren't any salespeople, no one's buying the product and we're all going home. And so it's like this idea of like dividing the work and knowing each piece of the work is so important. And that mission is making our customer the hero. And being able to rally around a mission is what's so important in my opinion. Right? When you're a when you're a 20 person startup, when I first started here, I mean Dave was the integrator. He like Okay, I don't know all the things, so let's go ask Dave. And like he became the integrator, and that was super important. You get to fifty or sixty people, you can't do that any anymore. What you need to do is everyone needs the autonomy to be awesome. They need it, right? And that autonomy to be awesome comes with an accountability and responsibility. You, as a as part of the leadership team, have to go and enforce. It's like it's great you have autonomy, but did you go talk to this person? Did you talk to this person? Did you make sure this customer is going to be happy? all these different things. And when you come into an organization and you're two months in and there's someone who's been sitting there for five years, gritting it out, it's like, did you talk to them? And these are things you have to teach within the organization when you grow at such a breakneck speed. 
And there becomes these pillars, right? These pillars of people who know exactly what's taken place in the past, who can help you make the decisions in the future. Now, sometimes the decisions of the past were like, okay, we were going north, like, oh, wow, that was, we're going south now. I mean, that's just, that was, it, that totally didn't work. And you have to be able to step back and recognize that. And it is very, very difficult when you've been down on the ground in the grid, in the grit, doing it for five, six years, and then being able to pull yourself back out and say, yeah, we did that, but now that won't scale. We can't do that for a hundred thousand. For us, it's water meters. We do things for a hundred thousand water meters. We're doing it for 500. Now we need to do it for a hundred thousand or 200,000. It doesn't scale. And this idea of scale is the most important part where. I could go and be a mad scientist in the back and make it work, but hey, that doesn't scale. And these are the things you have to go do. And part, part of what you have to do is you have to go and drive that culture that says, hey, it's inclusive. Our customer is the hero of the story, not us. That's kind of how I think about it. I'm not sure there's a recipe, but uh, that's kind of what we went through. I think the scaling thing is interesting because the there's stuff that you... Like, because I think the opposite is also true when you're going zero to 20 or, or whatever, where I think people start think trying to build overbuild or try and think too much about, well, this needs to be able to scale. And it's like, well, that's all well and good. But if we don't actually get this built, we're just going to go out of business. So there's that balance of. <laughs> That still like, happens when, yeah. you're, when you're 30 to 100. That still happens. I mean, let's be oh, clear. I'm sure it does. <laughs> right. But I think that that whole notion, like, I think that that's that's one of those things that's really hard to navigate is how do you build the 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 right solution that's the right balance of scalability versus uh, at, yeah first let, let me just dispel this the word right really makes me feel uncomfortable because there is never right right well there's <laughs> right what now is that, what, what is what is going to work for right now and right. what doesn't handcuff me down the road right and what that is for me with a company that's grown to almost 100 people and what that is for anusha in for a company of 20 are likely very very different things Right. I have customers yeah. on every coast in the United States. Right. That has a different feel for it. Right. And my customers actually have physical things. That's different too. So each startup is going to be a little bit different. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And to your point of like having those pillars and, and almost those early, those folks early in that have gone through the grit end up being the integrators. Right. But it's not just about scaling the product. It's about scaling the mentality and scaling the institutional knowledge that they have, right? So that they become focal points perhaps of different teams, but those teams have to continue on and expand out. Mm. Yeah. And, and, that team, and when you think about that team concept, what you can't have is people back there going, I'm trying to make sure that like no one else knows what I know because mm -hmm. then I'll always be yeah. needed. These are yeah. the things you've got to go figure out from a leadership perspective because there's just an innate human thing that we all do, myself, everybody does. And what you have to do is like reject that thought process and be able to say, I'm putting in confluence. So if I'm not here because I went to Las Vegas for the weekend, someone can find it. Yeah. That yeah. mentality becomes so important because everything changes over time. When you go from you know, 20 or 30 to 100 people, so many things change. You've got to write this stuff down. You've got to have a structure. You got to have what, what, what I would call an enterprise operating system, some process to allow you to go, hey, this is an issue. This isn't an issue. These are the things that really bring teams together. 100%. We have a, a head of infrastructure that uh, at least once a week, I will hear him say this, where he's like, my sole purpose is to automate myself out of a job because I don't want to be doing the same things in five years or even next week that I'm doing today, because that means I'm not growing, right? So, and that's kind of the way to, to sort of put a positive spin on that culture of don't hold on to information because then you'll be stuck doing what you're doing. You want to move, you want to grow and move on to something else. In fact, that's advice that I give, like when, that's how I've moved up in my career. That's how, like, whenever people who report to me talk, ask me questions, like, what do you do? It's like, right, the, the idea is, if I can get out of the job I'm doing now to work on other things, that's that's what's enabled me to move up. And so writing things down, training my replacement, you know, what automating my way out of it, whatever it is, those are all the ways to to start. Like if the company can't see you, like can't see anyone else in the role that you're currently in, that's a problem. Like that's mm -hmm. going to stifle your own ability to grow. Yeah, it's a, I, I love to automate piece. So when I was at Google, that if you're going to do it a second time, write a script so no one ever has to do it again. And when yep. you run at scale like Google does, 
it was like everything was automated. I mean, you, and that made everything kind of scary too. I press the automate <laughs> button, it goes across every data center in the world. It's like planet scale compute is, uh, is, is a bit scary sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we ran a whole episode on on this called Empowering Teams and I think it's a, you know, there's a there's an art to it. Some folks have a tough time like passing off the reins or or letting go of control and it usually is a at a C-suite or a founder that when you make that transition of that next layer, um, you know, having the 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 willingness to to give a little bit up, you know, and and uh trust, I think is a big piece of that. Like trust that it'll it'll get carried out, you know, if you if you had the right folks in place. Um, but Ben, I, I kind of want to talk on that piece too. So you, you mentioned um, uh, some some of that stuff from Google. Uh, Anusha, you worked with large companies at Intel in the past. What are some of these things from like bigger environments from a culture that you miss um, now that you're in a smaller environment? For me, I think some of it is when you think about culture, the culture is already set, so you don't have to think about it. Mm-hmm. Right? You're, you as an individual don't have to think about it. You just follow the culture and it's good. When you're in a startup like this, what you have to recognize is sometimes the culture is going to have to change. It changes from 20 people to 100. It has to change. Because when you're, when you're 20 or 30 people like we were, right, it was okay if we all kind of worked together and you didn't have a lot of autonomy because you're so connected. But once you get to 100 people, you can't be so well coordinated. And so being able to have autonomy to make decisions becomes really important. The other thing is, is like, you got to bring data to a lot of these things. And what oftentimes happens, especially as we grew, Sometimes the title took precedence over data, and you can't let that happen. What you've got to do is you've got to bring data to the table and be able to say, the options are this. Here's what the data is telling us. Sometimes data lies, and we all know that. We all know that sometimes data tells you one thing, and it really means another. And what we want to do is be able to use that as a guidepost to be able to make decisions. Because we always say, you know, the world is full of risks. We will be v- vigilant. And you're vigilant by using that data. And for me, when I think about that kind of growth spurt, that kind of what, what is it that's different between a Google or a Siemens like I've worked for and what's at uh, Olea is really that you're constantly refining that, that culture a little bit on how you think about things. For us, our mission is to eliminate all water loss in a water utility. That has not changed. That will not change. But how we go about it likely, likely will be tweaked every year just because what we learn through our process, what we learn through our customers will change. Well, Anisha, how about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I would say I completely agree with that. I love the idea of uh, of data over title. Um, I think that's actually one of the advantages of a smaller company oftentimes is that you don't have you don't have a, a huge hierarchy. Right. Um, it's it's fairly flat and everyone's kind of um, outcomes and data they produce speak for themselves or hopefully speak for themselves in the right culture. I'd say the thing I miss the most from a larger organization is some of the structure and the processes being in place um, and also backups. Right. In a small company, you normally do not have the luxury of having anyone backing up you know, functions completely. And, and if someone's out or, you know, someone is not well or something, it's, it's tough. So, you know, if I had to, it's probably one thing I would tweak and something that I'm focusing on now is we're moving, going from like 20 to 50, right. Is how do you double up on expertise and double up on roles and things like that? Yeah. Yeah, You know, and what that sparks me to remember too is, when you're in a large company, right? Even when I was at Google, there would be people who had 10 years at Google, but they did only two things in Google during that time. Yeah. And it's like, right. it's not that they're bad. It's like what they're trying to do is do something at scale, planet scale, planet size compute, right? But like they don't have that broad experience that allows you to have a little bit more perspective. And that's what's incredible about startups, right? Is you've got to think about everything. Even if you're an engineer, you kind of think about go to market. Even yes. if you're in go to market, you think about, well, wait, this has to run fast. Why would we write that in Python? That should be in C++, right? It's like this type of thought process happens across the business because everyone is trying to get focused on that customer, be able to say the customer needs this thing. And that, cus- that customer focus really makes a difference across the entire organization. I think that's a huge difference in between large companies. Because there's always that group of people in large companies 
I don't think about customers. I just try to keep the internal engine running, right? Mm. right. So one of the questions that following up on that for both of you, you know, we know that culture has to change the culture of a small company to a large company. What are some of the things that you look for, like to identify when that change needs to happen? Because I've been at plenty of places where the the founders are so intent on certain cultural things that were, yeah, you're right. That's what got us here, but it's not what's going to get us there. And so sort of identifying some of those things and how do you, how do you allow your culture to, to, to sort of evolve? Um, curious. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we are going through that process right now where we've come at it from the angle of just, you know, kind of a traditional retrospective, like what's working, what do we really want to hold on to and make sure that we scale that out in some way, shape or form and what's not working, right? Um, Or what do we want to continually improve or what do we have to change for scale? So one of the really important important elements for us from day one has always been transparency. We, we were both my co-founder and I have been committed to making sure that everyone in the company knows as much as they want to know about different fields. Right. And to, to Ben's point, whether that is the tech stack that's being used on the business development side, or whether that is the, the prospects that we're going after, the sectors we're going after vice versa from the engineering team, if you want information, it should be, for the most part, available, right, and accessible. Um, so that's something that we are really looking at how to continue. Now, the, the mechanisms by which we convey the transparency and convey the information have to scale up, right? Like we can't necessarily do a, a, the same elements of frequency of all hands, for example, or something like that, right? We're not all sitting at the same table all the time and like Mm -hmm. cranking out code, like all of that's a little bit different. But that core value of transparency, we want to continue. Now, the things that we are trying to scale out or improve on are things like being able to support multiple simultaneous customers in different geographic regions. And that just takes a different mindset um, than if you are a team of four or five, right? And it's just coffee. And also the workflow. Yeah. <laughs> just a lot of coffee. A little bit of beer. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's just a, beer, a couple of these uh, is what it takes. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I yeah, heard and, it and a lot more say- than just in October. <laughs> so- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I clearly heard Anusha say, hey, there was a weekend where there was a lot of beer bottles and pizza. So that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, I think for months after that, my daughter was like, my mom throws really wild coding parties. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, Anusha, you bring up a, a really interesting point. Uh, and I think it's not it's it's important to highlight, too, because I think it's something that was also really uh, exposed when everybody went remote. And, and, and that's kind of like, how do people still have access to that information on what's happening across other departments when they're not physically coming together and that's just casually happening in the kitchen or wherever it happens? You know, we realized that it was like, you know, as the company was growing, uh, yeah, folks wanted to know more about, yeah, what is the, the sales strategy now? And, you know, what, you know, what's in the pipeline? We're excited to hear what's coming. Um, and it wasn't, a, we didn't have the time to keep doing these, these all hands every single week, right? So we do monthly all hands. So in, in turn, we decided to do a weekly newsletter called the yoke, which we send out every, uh, Thursday or whatever. And it goes out and it shows you by department, like, Hey, this is what's going on in marketing. Oh, this is what's happening on the media team. Um, and it gives everybody a little more exposure and a little bit more like they feel like they're a part of something larger than just what am I doing in my you know, my space, my department. Um, so that was, you know, that was something that worked well for us, but I, I like that point. because I think access to information and make it accessible. It's a really interesting point about, you know, as you get bigger, something you're not always thinking of, but your team probably is. And you yeah. never do it right either, because no matter what you do, there's always, once you get to a large enough size, it's, it doesn't fit to someone's communication mm-hmm. style or consumption style. And so yeah. part of being a leader is just accepting that sometimes there are going to be some people who are just like, oh, yeah, I don't read the yoke because it's just too much time to go look at it. And every time I looked at it, it wasn't really valuable for me. And it's like, and then it's like, okay, do I go address that or do I continue to do this? And those are 
oftentimes hard, hard things to go do. Yep. Yeah. A lot of it is, it's not personal, right? Like mm-hmm. part of the, a lot of those things you, you just kind of, you have to commit to the core value in doing your best and perhaps create different mechanisms for consumption. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. You can't, you can't uh, appease everyone all the time. Yeah. My personal opinion is I, I like the, uh, like at Google, they did the TGIF and kind of figured they're famous for it. And it's, it was fantastic as a, as an individual who sat in the audience and just watching it get consumed is awesome. Cause Sergey would do things like, Hey, you know, I tried to download Wally for my daughter two nights ago and it didn't work. So where's the play guy? Come up here and explain to me why, why, what's going on with the downloads? And like there's an SVP has to get out of his chair and trot up to the stage. He's like, well, gee, I don't know. And it's just like, I'll have someone go look at it. And he's just like, yeah, you should make sure this works. I mean, how often is this happening to customers? I'd really like to know. And it, it creates, it's, you know, it's a little bit of play back and forth, but it also shows like at the end of the day, there are things that are very important to customers. For him that night, it was to be able to watch Wally with his daughter and he couldn't do it because he couldn't get the download to work for some reason. And being able to make it personal like that, but also put a little humor in it and put the people who are accountable on the spot is helpful. And that's why I like TGIFs. But I, I find the kind of like newsletter thing hard to do personally, because it's just like, everyone looks at every word. And you know, you have 100 people are like, okay, they're going to dissect that baby. I'd much rather have that conversation personally. That's my style, though. What, what is TGIF? Thank God. Like, it's should, I, should I Google it? <laughs> Thank God. It's Friday. So we, it was the week. It was a weekly time to ask uh, Sergey and and uh, Larry, anything you wanted. And you'd be surprised. It was amazing what people would ask. It was oh, amazing. Oh, interesting. Like so that. anybody can ask. That's cool. Yeah. Like I they like don't that. have my favorite candy bar anymore. Why not? And then the guy from the, the uh, uh, real estate group would have to try it up and explain why there isn't a candy bar. I swear <laughs> to God, it happened. I swear <laughs> I to God, it. it happened. Which is kind of cool. You know, we do the weekly all hands, but it's almost like we're just talking at as opposed to receiving in you know mm-hmm. requests or information i really like that that's a good uh, idea it's, it's fantastic there's also those these little tools where they can ask questions ahead of time they can right. upvote downvote and, and do some of the questions and we do a little bit of that i like the interactiveness of it some people don't like it because sometimes they talk over each other i'm like well yeah but i don't know that's me i, <laughs> I just i again uh, you know having spent four years at google i love a lot of things that they tried now, there are other things that didn't work as well but that's good. One of the yeah. things that's so my current company does something similar on Mondays where there's a little bit of a push out and then there's a and a ask the the CEO and COO or ask anything. It's just ask anyone anything. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that I find interesting is there's so many people who are scared to ask a question. And I think that like it takes a little while to get people comfortable with that. And again, it's a cultural thing, right? You have to be unafraid to like because nobody's going to react badly. Like there's no stupid questions, you know, that type of thing and being comfortable sort of sharing that. Um, and yeah, but you got to do the plants. You got to go and find one of your uh, VPs or someone that, that love embarrassing themselves and say, okay, it's your turn to ask the embarrassing question. What are you going to ask? And they'll, add, and they'll, they'll do it and it'll, it'll create a situation where uh, it's not bad to ask embarrassing questions. Like this kid who asked well, what's the deal with the candy bars was unbelievable. But like, they took it seriously. And that, <laughs> that actually set a tone. It set a tone for me. And when, that was the moment in time for me that I was like, man, this is really good. Yeah. <laughs> Which great. is also, right? Like, it's also really good to model the behavior that you're looking for. So oftentimes, I'll be the one in the group that asks the silly question of like, hey, wh- what's wrong with the plant, right? Like, <laughs> like mm-hmm. something like that, just to make it comfortable in that environment and then right you pull down the app and we figure out it needs more water or whatever but like it's yeah (laughs) but that idea of modeling the behavior so it becomes comfortable for folks is such an important part of the culture is just you can't ask people to do what you're not willing to do yourself yeah right yeah, we've we've seen like a level of, you know, just being vulnerable as a as a leader, you know, gives folks a little bit of comfort to put their guard down and, and not feel yeah. intimidated um, for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Ask me, ask me what kind of candy bars we have here. Right. Um, I'll tell you. Oftentimes, if like I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And oftentimes, you know, I will literally be very um, 
transparent or not, not transparent, but I guess the word is like very obvious about saying when I don't know something. I think that's mm-hmm. also an element of the vulnerability that's been really important to our culture to just be like, I don't know, but I can go find out. Right. Right. I feel like so much trust is born out of that. Like there's a kind of courage that has to come from saying, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like me. I don't, I'm an engineer. I don't know anything about sales. And we were talking about like these cold sales calls that some of them have to go do. And I'm like, wow, that's brave. And like for one, of the, for one of the guys is like, oh, I'd love to do it. They'll never remember me. And they'll like, they'll just call. And I'm like, I'm afraid they're going to remember me. And it's like, it's this kind of like, I, I didn't, and like I embarrassed myself in front of the whole sales team because I just, I, I don't think I could have done it. Right. It's just one of these things that I think being able to put yourself in their shoes and be able to admire what they can do that you can't is such an important piece about being able to like bring together a team. Cause there's, I mean, to run any type of business, there's no way any one person knows everything. It's just impossible. Mm. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, I think we um, are going to wrap this segment up and transition into our, our final segment here where we'll spin the, the community wheel behind me. It's called Round Out My Career. And um, these are topics and questions that we have crowdsourced from the Hatchpad community. And um, yeah, we'll kind of riff on them. I'll give it a spin. I'm not sure I trust the wheel. It's rigged. <laughs> yeah, in fact, it's all a facade. Okay, yeah, it's goals. We're. Um, I can't even like, read it. It's in red. You must have written in red. I don't believe it says goals. We put it on a green screen and then we fill in what we want it to say. Um, so, <laughs> so what we want, yeah. what, we, what we actually want to ask um, is uh, is not about goals at all. Um, I actually we we yeah we picked a question uh, that we thought would be a little bit more pertinent to this conversation and it's about interviewing um and it's not so much from you know the hiring manager's perspective but as as a candidate interviewing with a company so uh somebody approaches you know Alea or Korsha uh and is trying to navigate what the culture is like what kind of questions do you think you know candidates can come to those interviews with to to get a better perspective on what the company culture is actually like because sometimes you're fed something that maybe isn't accurate when you get in the door and you realize it. What what would you say are good questions to really try to get a good view of what that culture is like before stepping foot in the door? I, I'll go. Guess, I, yeah, what's up with I, you? I, I, it's like, I would say, do you have a written bullet point list of your cult, company culture? Almost everyone does. Say, well, let's go through it, show it to me. And then you ask, which one really isn't true? Because there's always one. And if mm. you can ask that question, they can be honest and go, well, you know, we struggle with this one or we struggle with these two. That helps you understand where they're at because then they're saying the other ones are true. These are ones we're, tra- we're striving to get to. Helps you kind of like focus in on like where are they at? And then you can say, okay, this either fits to what I want to go do or not want to go do. And allows you to kind of have a little bit of a compass of, of how to ask the next question. Because for me, if they don't have any, if they say, I don't have anything written down, it's like, oh, well, then you don't have one. Because literally, if you haven't written it down, it's just, to me, it's baloney, mm. right? Interesting. Yeah. yeah I kind of like that tactic of, uh, you know, tell me which one, you know, isn't, isn't your, your greatest strength uh, uh, from a culture. <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh, Anusha, how about yourself? Yeah, I'd say a good question from, for us would be, what is your, how has retention been? What does your retention policy look like, right? So it oftentimes it's very telling how long folks stay around um, as to whether they are in a positive culture, positive working environment, to lo- collaborative team, and that can tell a lot. I think that's an interesting one because um, an unwillingness to share that is certainly going to be a tell, right? If they talk about how oh, we've had this retention and we've kept this, you know, if it, then it's kind of clear that it's, it's going to be positive. But if they're in any way cagey or hesitant, then even if you don't get the direct answer to the question, you basically got the answer to the question. It's, right. That's a good yeah. one. That's like really, that. yeah, really, really good one. Um, and I think that's, yeah, we, we, you know, you can see, you know, the writing on the wall, if they've got a high attrition, it's like some, something's, something's not quite right here. Um, Mike, what about you? Anything that, 
uh, that you've kind of experienced? Yeah. I mean, in my experience, it's the asking what the culture is goes only so far because I think a lot of it, especially if you're interviewing with some of the founders or some of the people that have been there for a while, what they think the culture is and what the culture actually is are not always the same. Um, because, you know, once it's, once the company's moved on a little bit, like what the day to day looks like. So I try to ask more questions about like certain situations, like what went well, what went poorly? Like, how can you guys tell me about like the same types of questions that they ask me? Like, can you tell me about a time that something didn't go the way you thought it was going to go? Those types of questions, um, to try and find out, like, can you, like, what was something that you guys did recently that didn't go particularly well? And what was the reaction? And and so on and so forth. And and to me, like, is it a collaborative environment is way more important to people like was it a supportive and collaborative thing. So I'm looking for certain things and asking that question. I think probably my advice to someone would be think about the things from a cultural perspective that are important to you from if you've worked at places before things that you've liked, and try and come up with questions that might help you understand whether or not that company exudes those qualities. Um, that's the other thing, like just because this company says their culture is X, Y, and Z. Some of those might not really be all that like impactful for you as a, as an individual. So it's also important to go in knowing, like having an idea of like, what is important to me? What am I looking for? And, and I think the other thing to that is there's a big difference between a virtual culture and an in-person culture. Yes. Everyone yes. wants to tell you that that's not true. It is 100% true. And a lot of it has to do with how does the interaction happen? Oh, most interactions happen via Slack. Wow, that's, that's really hard. Like, how do I get the emotion? How do I get the body exactly. language out of that? And it's super hard. But when you're in the room and you see the person and you can go, I need to ask another question after, that, after they gave me that answer because clearly I didn't get the full answer out of it. Mm-hmm. Those are really telltale. And that, that's one of the things that I've talked to a lot of my staff about is there is a certain portion of, of us that can absolutely do virtual and it will work. And there are other ones, it's like, gosh, I need you in the office at least, you know, twice a week so we can sit down and talk. And we have people who work from all over the United States, in which case I ask them, hey, let's, why don't you come in at least every other month so we can sit down and talk and understand each other a little bit better. It, it is a huge cultural divide. And I think oftentimes people are like, well, why would it be different? Mm-hmm. It really is. It's I a really hot, hot topic right now, yeah. uh, especially in, in from the world of, of recruiting and hiring anyways, is, you know, a lot of these companies are now, you know, right around this time of year uh, or just this time, uh, it, folks are trying to bring folks back in. And the question is, you know, well, well tell me why. And you need to kind of have, yeah, you need to be prepared to, to explain why now I do have to come back in and face the commute and deal with those things with when we've been doing it for two, two plus years now, um, it's, you're getting a lot of kickback, a lot of kickback from candidates anyways, saying, yeah. you know, I need more and you need to tell me more why. Um, and I, I completely agree. I think it's, it's a, it's really challenging to, to, to main it, to manage a, a remote, fully remote culture and have pe- people feel like they're a part of something beyond just I'm coming to, to my keyboard to work. Um, and so you know, one of the things that we did at, at Hatch was, a company retreat and it was an all, all company wide. It was, um, you know, cha- challenging for folks to kind of get there. And, uh, but once you were there, you know, that's, that was where, you know, kind of the magic happened, uh, was, you know, three days of, of being able to, to really engage with your team that you, you never get a chance to do fully remote. Um, so I, I agree with you, Ben, it is a really, it is, um, Alea, uh, what is the, the remote, uh, work you can, you, can be, you can be fully remote if you want I'll, I'll give you an example right it's like who's ever done really really good ux fully remote there's probably a small small number yeah i tell you ux is one of these things is just so hard to get right and it's like you gotta really talk and see people um i think it's hard for me what i look for in people is like the willingness to come in so we can have some of these conversations mm-hmm. but like you know we're we're in a build session right now right it's like if they come in, it's headphones on, keyboard up, like they're going at it. And you just look at it, it's like, there's no reason for them to be here. But then there are those moments where you see them gathering around talking. It's just like, they got some sort of problem. But you know what? That's good they're there in, in person. And it's this thing where you have to train the people to know when, like, listen, we ought to just go into the office for, this, for tomorrow and work this out. And that is the culture you've got to go figure out how to go drive. 
And it's, n- it's not a straight line at all. It's constantly changing. I use UX as the perfect example because it's like, that's hard. That's hard. Yeah, we've heard a lot of like product teams, they, they need that in-person collaboration as well because they, they work with so many different cross departments. They really need to have that in-person presence, whereas engineering maybe sometimes isn't as necessary uh, as folks on like that product and the product marketing teams. Now the engineers tell me, go tell me. Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. I was going to say, tell the engineering team, draw me an architectural diagram remotely. I was just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I was sorry. just okay. going to say that. No, you're absolutely right. Like we've measured the time it takes to get to a point we're happy with a new architectural flow virtually versus in person. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's a huge difference. And, and you, you get, you kind of find alignment so much faster when you're in the same room with someone because of all of the additional body cues and things and just the interactions that you can key off of. Right. Um, or even just like, you know, virtual whiteboarding apps only take you so far. Right. Sure. There's, there's no replacement for standing around and sketching something out. Um, it'll be interesting to see. We have the same approach now where it is, you can be fully remote. We've tried to, with this new space, say, if you come in at least three days a week, then you get a dedicated office, right? Otherwise it's kind of an open space. And, and I feel like there's just an energy to the in-person collaboration when possible that you cannot replace. Yeah, that's the Good. alcohol. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's what this culture, that's what we'll put a bow on it. This culture conversation is going to come down to alcohol and candy bars. uh, It's what really thrives. Yeah. It's like carrot cake. There's some very strong opinions on both sides, right? (laughs) That's right. That's right. Well, I think we'll wrap on that note. Um, You you guys have been fantastic. Thank you so much for spending time with us and and contributing. And um, yeah, we, we appreciate you having on the pair program. It's been a real pleasure having you guys. Thanks. Thanks.